Okay, fine. Um, SWAP is um, Sex Workers Outreach Project of New South Wales. We're the state just to the north of um, Victoria. We've got an almost fully decriminalised um, sex work legal framework. Um, decriminalisation for sex work means that um, there are basically no sex work specific laws in the criminal code and sex workers operate on a fairly level playing field just as if we were news agents, doctors, plumbers or whatever. Um, SWAP is basically um, a peer organisation. Um, we have a peer based outreach team with female, trans, culturally and linguistically diverse um, officers, an Indigenous officer and myself as the male officer so that we cover hopefully the full spectrum of sex workers in New South Wales. It's also managed by peers and has um, a peer-led board. Um, we work mainly under an Ottawa Charter system of health and we're funded by the New South Wales Department of Health. Um, so, to give you a brief overview of sex work in New South Wales, we have the decriminalised legal framework and we estimate there are probably about 10,000 sex workers in New South Wales. They work in brothels, private work, escort work and street-based work. Um, it's estimated that around 10% are male, 5% possibly transgender, leaving 85% female workers. And male sex workers are classified as a priority um, group for health um, promotion in New South Wales. Um, now, I'm said approximately all the way down through there because we don't do a census on sex workers. Sex work is still fairly stigmatised, even though it's decriminalised. And sex workers don't present outwardly, OK? Um, they don't walk down the street and say they're a sex worker. Often they don't disclose that they're a sex worker to anybody apart from their clients. So they're very much a hidden population. So um, access and things like that can be a little bit difficult. Um, now with male sex workers, who we're going to talk about today, um, street-based work, which is where um, basically you advertise on the street by having a physical presence on the street. It doesn't necessarily mean that the actual nitty-gritty business of sex work is actually done on the street. It's um, almost never not. People go back to a nearby apartment, they go to the client's house, things like that. It's basically what's called the soliciting, which I'd call the advertising that takes place on the street. Um, parlour and brothel work is where you work for a management or a, in a house or a premises and there are a group of sex workers working together under management. We only have about 30 guys um, who work in that sort of situation. We've got two brothels in Sydney, um, one in one of the larger regional centres and they're fairly small owner operated. Um, basically everybody else works um, via the internet and what we call private work. Um, private work is what I do as a sex worker. Um, I work from my own apartment. I advertise independently on the internet and most of the time um, I work completely alone just for myself and that's really standard um, right through New South Wales and most of Australia for um, half the female workers probably and basically all the male workers. Um, defining who's actually a sex worker is fairly easy from the point of view it's somebody who um, receives some sort of remuneration which may be um, money or services or favours for um, their sexual labour but not so many people identify as being a sex worker. They may do some form of sex work, but having a sex worker identity is a completely sort of different thing for people. A lot of the time it's because, um, especially with the guys, um, it's very much a casual thing that a lot of people do, and they may only do it um, as, what's the word? Um, little as once a year, they may only do it once in a lifetime. They've done sex work, but they're not necessarily a sex worker. So where one draws the line there is a little bit difficult. Just to give you a brief history of how things developed, um, before the internet and technology, it was all street-based work and we were criminalised at that stage. So um, there was very little newspaper advertising and what was done was done in the massage companion sort of very much a disguised um, sort of look. Um, actually, those laws still remain, but um, 
and they didn't go with decriminalisation, but um, now everybody, including the major newspapers, treat them as they don't exist and people can advertise in the newspapers fairly freely. Um, in the 1980s, we got pages and things and mobile phones, which meant that we didn't have to stand on the street quite so much. And with the decriminalisation, we were able to advertise in print. And that was when the decline of street-based work for male workers um, started and people started moving off the street. It gets um, a bit cold in the winter, your feet get sore standing up. And one of the reasons is clients have to actually travel to see you, whereas with the internet, you can be ordered a little bit like a pizza. So we moved off the street and then um, with smartphones, mobile apps, um, cheaper mobile phones and stuff like that, we became very independent and everybody moved to private work. Um, so, and that also enabled um, many more people to do it on an ad hoc basis. And there's been a little bit of research done on that. We have some very good um, by world standards, sex work um, researchers in Australia, and there have been estimate, estimates that about 5% of all men who have sex with men um, have been paid for a sexual service um, sometime in the last um, 12 to six months. Okay, and people drop in and out of um, the profession fairly quickly. Makes my job of outreaching for health um, a little bit difficult because there's a very high churn rate. Even with female sex workers in Australia, there's estimates that 50% um, every five years, I think, is the turnover rate. And the fact that everything's just a little bit hidden and um, stigmatised also makes that fairly difficult. Um, I'm going to refer to a piece of research that was done here in um, Melbourne by a PhD student um, just a couple of years ago where he was um, wanting to look at male sex workers who um, worked via the internet and um, he could only, um, he approached the first 22 workers he approached in the first part of the study by um, getting their phone numbers from their ads and ringing them up. Seven of them were fairly amenable to um, taking part in the survey and 15% of them hung up on him the moment they heard that he was a researcher. And that is sort of the attitude that you get from male sex workers. They're doing a job, they don't want to be disturbed, they don't want to be re researched, and quite often they are not particularly happy to be outreached either. Um, they're an invisible population in a lot of the research. I'd frame that slightly differently. Um, because of the stigmatisation that goes with sex work um, and then the next array of stigmatisation that may be come from being a gay man, um, being perceived quite often if you're a sex worker as being HIV positive or an injecting drug user, neither of those things um, are actually standard for male sex workers. Um, a lot of people are reluctant to tell anybody at all that they're doing sex work. Um, I deal with guys that um, live with their partner who doesn't know what they do. Um, nobody at all knows what they do. And they're able to hide what they do and um, operate with what's called concealable stigma. So I'm a male sex worker maybe who does out calls and I've got a city job. A lot of um, the guys have a first job and sex work's their second job, or sex work's their first job, and they have a second job to have a more regular stream of income because sex work tends to be a very up and down profession as far as money goes. You'll make a lot of money one week and possibly no money at all the next week. So I'm a guy who's doing out calls. I have my um, gym bag, which has my sex work gear in it, and also what I wear to jobs. And the rest of the, my wardrobe is my normal gay boy and suit in the city here. And when I do a job, I take my sex work persona out of the gym bag, put it on, carry the gym bag to the front door of the client's place, and then I become the sex worker. And I inhabit my sex work identity from the moment he opens the door until the moment he shuts it behind me, and then I go back to being so from the city or Citibank or Macquarie Bank or architect or student 
or whatever my daytime persona is. Um, these guys don't want to be um, outreached by health and people like me quite often because that breaks that barrier and they feel that leaves them vulnerable in the, some sort of future to changes of law, um, blackmail, stigmatisation by their friends, a whole pile of sort of unknown things that play on your mind if you are a stigmatised and discriminated community, um, which unfortunately we are. But with concealable stigma, you can just step outside that and he's over there and he's in the cupboard and it's no problem at all. OK, um, there are more barriers to engaging um, in a health perspective with um, male sex workers. Um, the first one I've sort of tried to cover for you and if I haven't made it clear because it's really quite nebulous and it varies from person to person, but I've tried to give some of the sort of basic um, strains that run through it, just ask me questions. So we don't identify as a sex worker. Um, not being female is a barrier to sex work identity because everything presented in the media, um, most of the outreach is for female sex workers. If you see a sex worker in the media, it's a female sex worker. And so a lot of guys don't feel that they belong over there and that they're some sort of slightly different animal over here and they, they don't engage with services. Okay, there's also having no perceived um, need for services. And it's not just a, that it's not a perceived need for services. Um, in New South Wales, where I operate, most of the men who um, sex work are middle class white guys, 25 to 45, um, with university degrees, paying off their mortgages and stuff like that. And they don't see themselves as um, clients of any service at all. One of the ways I engage with them actually is to frame things of can you help me and give me advice? They're always willing to give advice for those other sex workers, the less um, advantaged sex workers that live in their imagination, but actually it's them that I'm asking, um, you know, what do they need? Um, yeah, and then we have stigma and discrimination, which is an ongoing thing um, for sex workers and there's historical roots going back. I'm not quite sure how far. But we all experience it um, due to our choice of work. Uh, and as I said, most male sex workers um, experience further layers of stigma and discrimination. Um, and then on top of that, we have um, discrimination by the law. Now, in New South Wales, because we have decriminalisation, um, there's not the stigma of being a criminal element, but there are laws around Jesus, that was quick. <laughs> um, HIV and things that um, do uh, lend a criminal tone to our work and that puts people in the sex work closet a fair bit. Okay, I'll have to go very quickly now. We had a male um, survey in about 2009 which um, went through a number of things but the uh, main thing we heard, found that there wasn't a great visibility for the project and a lot of people didn't know about it and a lot of that was to do with the um, churn rate in the industry. And um, a lot of people didn't want to know about it and didn't want to know about it on a one-to-one -one basis of physical outreach, which has been the model that most sex work outreach projects use for a long time and that is actually physically going to the street and talking to sex workers or going to their, their home or going to the brothel. But people didn't actually want that. And so um, we've re reorientated ourselves and now most of my work is done on the, the internet and I can do it very nicely sitting down at a desk. And we advertise our service where male sex workers advertise theirs. So we advertise in the classifieds where male sex workers advertise and we also advertise on gay hookup sites using the same sort of advertising method which is our hookup profile as the sex workers use and it sits right next to um, sex worker profiles and on those sites there are internal messaging systems. So a lot of my outreach is done by um, typing messages backwards and forwards. The sex worker's working in his sex work persona, he's quite reasonably happy to engage, okay, and he's doing it 
fairly anonymously. I don't know who he is actually or where he is. Occasionally I'll recognise somebody by their tattoos or whatever that they've shown on their profile, but that's about as far as that goes. So that's an example of a profile. So where the, our logo is, there'd be a torso shot of a sex worker if it was an actual sex work profile. Um, I also put my link to my own sex worker profile, which has nothing to do with my day job, because a lot of people don't, still don't trust the profile that represents the organisation. A lot of people will call me on the phone that I use to sex work on, rather than on the office number. We've got a number of social media sites where we move information around um, so that people can see it and sex workers can see it and pass it on to other sex workers. Um, and I've got it set up so everything feeds into everything else So um, because I only have three days a week to cover a lot of ground. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Um, we set everything up um, a week in advance and plan it around themes to get maximum impact. We've got Twitter for quick communication and sex workers. And now in the United States, have moved very much onto Twitter and Facebook, and that's starting in the States, in he, um, here in Australia. Um, for people who want to remain entirely anonymous and not have a Twitter or a Facebook profile that might link them to their sex work, we offer a mail out service that they'll use. Um, every sex worker's got a sex worker email under their sex working name, and so everything gets put into a digest weekly and sent out for people who don't want to out themselves or even partially out themselves on the internet. We have one printed resource that we still use and that we're putting online. And the idea is also to get sex workers to work as safe sex educators to their clients, which they've been doing for a long time, but to support them in that. And that's it, apart from the stats, um, which are fairly basic, but in the time that we've been doing this, We've managed to um, have a system where we contact every advertising male sex worker in New South Wales as soon as a new ad goes up, so we get 100% market penetration. Our contacts, which we initiate with sex workers, have gone up by 200%. Their contacts with us have gone up by 30%, and physical contact of them walking into the office has remained stable. Thank you.